Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines that we're tracking for you this evening. Indian equities struggle for direction in a choppy session. The Sensex and the Nifty end in the red as traders turn cautious ahead of events like the ECB's rate decision. Mounting geopolitical turmoil adding to the caution even as the RBI's move to infuse liquidity offers some support. China changes its monetary policy stance for the first time in 14 years to moderately loose. Also promises more proactive fiscal stimulus to shore up investment and consumption. Syrians celebrate the fall of Bashar al-Assad after five decades of dynastic rule, but the power vacuum threatens stability. Israel occupies a Syrian buffer zone, terming it a defensive move. India calls for a peaceful and inclusive political process led by the Syrians. Godrej Consumer raises the red flag on continued consumption growth pain, scales back its Q3 volume growth outlook to zero. The GCPL stock tanks 11% leads other FMCG stocks into the red. Ula to ula hai, lekin chetak to shola hai. <laughs> Rajiv Bajaj takes a dig at rival Ola Electric after Bajaj Auto was named the Outstanding Company of the Year at the CNBC TV18 India Business Leader Award, says the Chetak has overtaken Ola Electric to become the largest selling electric two-wheeler across India in December. Importers of laptops and personal computers may be in for a breather. Sources say the government may extend the non-prohibitive import authorization scheme for these products beyond the 31st of December. The move comes with just over a month before Donald Trump assumes the U.S. presidency. Prime Minister Modi boos veterans to Rajasthan as the three-day summit kicks off. The state receives investment pledges worth 35 lakh crore rupees, with Adani Group alone promising to invest 7.5 lakh crores. Over 40 Delhi schools received bomb threats via email. Police declares the email a hoax as a proxy server was used to send the mail. Initial investigations trace the IP address of the sender to a small city in the U.S. in the New York district. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh begins his three-day visit to Russia, where he is scheduled to hold talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Singh will also attend a ceremony to induct a Russian-manufactured stealth warship INS Tushil into the Indian Navy. Well, let's start with the day's trading action. Indian equities struggled for direction in a choppy session. The Sensex and the Nifty closing a quarter of a percent lower. This after traders turned cautious ahead of events like the ECB's rate decision and mounting geopolitical turmoil. Banks also falling in line, down by about 100 points. That's the Nifty Bank. The Sensex down 200 points, 60 points lower on the Nifty 50. With the Bitcap index, of course, closing in the green up by about half a percent today so bucking the trend prashant is here to wrap up the day's trading action prashant a choppy session to start the week on the lal street a bit of a sideways kind of a day essentially today uh, no point that it, uh, it looked like bulls were in control the market opened soft sold off uh, to the day's low by about 10 30. Uh, there was one big attempt at a recovery but that got sold into and we ended broadly down nifty bank nifty both up on your screen about a third of a percent lower Mid caps and small caps much better. Mid caps more than small caps today. And remember, the last fortnight has been good, especially for that the broader space. The small cap index essentially is down about 10% as we came into the week. Uh, the losses were in the FMCG pack, and the FMCG index was down 2% on the Nifty. That showed up in Tata Consumer, Lever, and Britannia, which were the top three losers uh, coming through. Gains coming through in LNT. There was Wipro and SBI Life, which of course from beaten down levels saw some uh, gains uh, today. Now, in the broader markets, more up than down, but, I mean, not separated by too much. So, see it and Map My India, both news-related names. See it, of course, that acquisition, Map My India reversing the earlier decision, uh, which the market did not like. Uh, these textile apparel makers, Gokul Das, uh, export 6%, Indo count was higher. Jewelry companies like Kalyan Jewelers stood out. P and Gargil at one point in the morning was up, but then uh, ended absolutely flat. HEG, I mean, uh, one day pause and back up again. You had Greaves Cotton, JK Tire, Himmat Sinka. Uh, names like Nugen, Signity, VR Logistics, which did well uh, as well. On the downside, you had uh, cuts coming through. More FMCG names, Godrich Consumer and Marico. Uh, consumer name like PVR Inox was down. Sinjin, Pyramal Health, Pharma, because of that biosecure setback, were lower. Star Health was under pressure. Ola Electric, India Cements and Neva Bupa, which saw some profit booking as well. Back to you. 
Prashant, many thanks. And as Prashant was talking to us about Godrej Consumer, the stock down 11%. This after it warned of margin pressure and weak growth in Q3. Now, the FMCG sector has scaled back its volume growth outlook. In fact, GCPL particularly has scaled it back to zero and said that input costs and competitive pricing pressures could take a toll on its margins. The forecast from GCPL, which underpins weak demand sentiment in the sector, took a toll on all other FMCG companies as well. Now, Mangalam is standing by. Mangalam, a uh, worrying outlook there from GCPL. CPL, but what does it mean for the industry? Well, two things that it means for the industry. Godrej Consumer's mid-quarter update is that one, demand conditions are still subdued and secondly, raw material price pressure, especially on the palm oil prices front, increases. So palm oil prices are higher by about 20 to 30 percent and as a result of which Godrej Consumer's own soap business has taken a bit of a dip. Why is that? Because the companies are either reducing their grammage or increasing their prices. With the kind of inventory that is there at the dealers already and the quick commerce doing well means that there is not enough, uh, you know, off take as well from the dealers. So all of this implies that volumes for Godrej this time around would be flat with a mid uh, to, uh, you know, mid, mid single digit sort of revenue growth as well, which is much lower than the company's own anticipation of high single digit volume in the second half, which they had downgraded in the previous quarter itself. The other part of their portfolio, household insecticides, was impacted by delayed winter in North India. It's a seasonal product. And add to all of this, the environment is competitive. Last year, same quarter, the company had reported abnormally high margins as well, which they alluded to as well. So all of that means that the bottom line will also be impacted because there would be sharp margin decline as the company continues to invest in marketing. What does this mean for other con consumer companies? One, demand is weak and secondly, raw material prices are high. But could there be a lesser impact than Godrej on something like an HUL? Because HUL had already said that there could be some bit of price increase and they hope to maintain their margins. But this was at the end of the second quarter. The question is, have things changed in the third quarter as well? With palm oil prices increasing, you know, there could be an impact on all other food players as well which use that as an ingredient so all those things are what we'll watch out for especially in the third quarter which is supposed to be a seasonally strong quarter could there be recovery here or could there be an impact here on which rests the great Indian consumer story at least for the next couple of quarters Mangala, many thanks for joining us. Yes, sir, the outlook there coming in from the FMCG sector is sober, to say the least. The big story that is moving the markets worldwide, China has changed its monetary policy stance to moderately loose, and it's done it for the first time in 14 years. China's Politburo, the country's top decision-making body led by President Xi, has also promised proactive fiscal stimulus measures to shore up investment and consumption. Now, the last time China followed a moderately loose monetary policy was after the 2008 global financial crisis. China's third quarter GDP growth was at 4.6 percent, keeping policymakers under pressure to unleash stimulus measures. So that's the latest there coming in from China. The other big global story that we continue to track, a new dawn in Syria. Thousands are celebrating the fall of Bashar al-Assad and the end of a dynastic rule in Syria, which lasted over 50 years. A dramatic 11-day blitz by rebel forces led to the toppling of the Assad regime. Rebels led by Abu Muhammad al-Julani have taken control of the capital, Damascus. Assad and his family have fled to Russia, where he is likely to be provided asylum. This is a setback for Russia and Iran, which have been supporting the Assad regime. Syrians were seen celebrating on the streets, but a power vacuum in the country threatens stability in the region. Israel has moved to occupy a buffer zone inside Syria, terming it a defensive move. India's external affairs ministry has called for a peaceful and inclusive political process led by the Syrian people. Here's a report on the rapid developments in Syria and how the world has responded. Gunshots rang out in celebration across Syria's capital on Sunday as rebel forces declared they had seized control of Damascus and thrown out President Bashar al-Assad. That spells an end to the Assad family's iron-fisted rule and comes after more than 13 years of civil war in a seismic moment for the Middle East. After mounting a sudden advance a week ago, the rebels on Sunday announced on state TV that they had toppled the president, calling him a tyrant. The Syrian rebel coalition said in a statement it was working to complete the transfer of power to a transitional governing body with full executive powers. It added that, quote, The great Syrian revolution has moved from the stage of struggle to overthrow the Assad regime to the struggle to build a Syria together that befits the sacrifices of its people. Assad, who had crushed all forms of dissent, flew out of Damascus for an unknown destination early on Sunday, according to army sources. Russia's foreign ministry later said in a statement Assad had left the country after giving orders for a peaceful handover of power.
As people celebrated the government's collapse in cities such as Aleppo, Syrian Prime Minister Mohammad Ghazi al-Jalali said he had been in contact with rebel commander Abu Mohammad al-Golani to discuss managing the transitional period. That marks a notable development in efforts to shape Syria's political future. The Prime Minister also called for free elections so Syrians can choose the leaders they want. But that would require a smooth transition in a country with complex competing interests from Islamists to groups linked to the United States, Russia and Turkey. Assad's ouster is a major blow to the influence of Russia and Iran in the region. They were key allies who propped him up in the long-running conflict's critical moments. The pace of events has stunned Arab capitals and raised fears of a new wave of regional instability. It marks a turning point for Syria, shattered by years of war that has killed hundreds of thousands of people. It has also forced millions abroad as refugees, many of them seen cheering on Sunday on the streets of their adopted homes from Lebanon to Germany. Western governments have long shunned the Assad-led state, but now they have to decide how to deal with a new administration that looks set to be influenced by a group globally labeled as terrorists. Led by the commander Golani, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, or HTS, is Syria's strongest rebel group. It used to be an al-Qaeda affiliate, and some Syrians are worried that it will impose draconian Islamist rule. Well, that is the latest from Syria, but from one war zone to another, U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has called for an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine and said it's time for Russian President Vladimir Putin to act on negotiations. His comments came a day after he met Ukrainian President Zelensky in Paris. Trump claimed that Ukraine would like to make a deal and stop what he referred to as the madness. Zelensky said the talks with Trump were constructive. Trump has also said that he would not try to replace Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell once he takes office in January. In an interview to NBC News, when asked if he would seek to remove Powell, Trump said, and I quote, No, I don't think so. I don't see it. End of quote. Powell's term ends in 2026. Trump also added that he didn't think Powell would go quietly. Remember, last month Powell said he would refuse to leave office early if Trump tried to oust him, arguing that removing him was not permitted under the law. Now, with just over a month to go for Donald Trump to assume the U.S. presidency, importers of laptops and personal computers may be in for a breather. We learn from sources that the government may extend the import authorization scheme for these products beyond the 31st of December. Ashmeth is standing by with more on the anticipated move. Ashmeth. Well, this is a critical issue for a number of uh, stakeholders. One, uh, obviously the industry state stakeholders, laptop manufacturers, PC manufacturers, the importers uh, will be watching very carefully. Uh, also, importantly, this is an issue that could have diplomatic significance between uh, the players, uh, between India as well as the US. Bear in mind, Donald Trump expected to take, uh, uh, take up charge as the President of the United States in January now. Uh, the issue boils down to whether or not India is imposing any form of restrictions on import of laptops. Uh, as well as PCs. Now, bear in mind, in August of 2023, a restriction scheme had been brought in. After lashback, it was replaced by an import authorization scheme, wherein uh, the imports can continue, uh, and, and there were no uh, restrictions with respect to the quantum of imports. Uh, there was only a, uh, an authorization scheme which was introduced. Uh, that authorization scheme runs out on December 31st. Now, we spoke to sources within the government. What they tell us is that they don't want to ruffle feathers, they don't want to create any disruptions, and to that end they pointed out that this import authorization scheme that has gone on for the last 15-18 months will now continue even beyond December 31st, will now be extended, so that support uh, being given to the industry. As far as uh, the formalization of the scheme, of the extension of the scheme, that has to be done by the Commerce Ministry. They will be issuing a notification shortly uh, to notify this extension beyond de December 31st. But clearly, as Donald Trump gets set to take charge in the U.S., the message that India is looking to send out, especially as far as laptop PC companies are concerned, the message that India is looking to send out is that we don't want to create any disruption, this import authorization scheme, to be extended beyond the December 31st. Back to you. Ashwin Benny, thanks. And Defence Minister Rajnath Singh began his three-day visit to Russia, where he's scheduled to hold talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Singh will also attend a ceremony to induct the Russian-manufactured stealth warship INS Tushil into the Indian Navy. Well, back to corporate news. Uh, Bajaj Auto MD Rajiv Bajaj took a dig at rival electric Ola Electric, after Bajaj Auto was named the Outstanding Company of the Year at the CNBC TV18 India Business Leader Awards, he said that its flagship Chetak has overtaken Ola Electric to become the largest selling electric two-wheeler across India in December. Based on December 1 registration data, 
Mm -hmm. Our electric scooter, the Chetak, is now the largest selling, not the third largest, the largest selling electric scooter in the country. So, your award could not be better timed. And uh, the message to me is, Ola to Ola hai, lekin Chetak to Shola hai. <laughs> so, you know, I just close by saying that uh, it was Ralph Nader who said, I want the guys who love to win. And if I can't have them, I want the guys that hate to lose. I am so fortunate. I have 10,000 guys who either love to win or hate to lose. And shares of Ola Electric continue to decline. The stock was down by 4% today after data showed that Bajaj Auto and TVS Motors have surpassed Ola Electric in terms of electric two-wheeler sales for the month of December so far. Just last week, CNBC 18 had reported that the Consumer Affairs Ministry is not satisfied with Ola's claims that 99% of consumer grievances are being resolved. Online retailer Flipkart is planning to list on the bosses in the next 12 to 15 months. According to reports, Flipkart said the proposed initial public offering would be the biggest of its kind among India's new age companies. In fact, the company said it has secured internal approvals to shift its domicile from Singapore to India ahead of the listing. The firm is targeting to list in the first quarter of FI26. The Walmart-owned company is valued at $36 billion and is India's largest e-commerce platform. The much-awaited Flipkart IPO, of course, will have to be preceded with a reverse flip. Shares of major contract drug manufacturers like Divi's Lab and Piramal Pharma as well as Newland Labs down in trade today. This came after the U.S. Biosecure Act was kept out of a key defense bill. This act was supposed to strengthen the demand pipeline for Indian companies as the new law was aimed at curbing China's influence. This decision also signals a potential softening of the U.S. view on Chinese biotech. We will head into a break, but don't go anywhere. Prime Minister Modi woos investors to Rajasthan as the three-day summit kicks off. The state receives investment pledges worth 35 lakh crore rupees. That and more when we return. Prime Minister Modi kicked off the three-day rising Rajasthan Global Investment Summit in Jaipur. Representatives from over 30 countries are participating in the summit. The state has received investment pledges worth 35 lakh crore rupees, with the Adani Group alone promising 7.5 lakh crore rupees in investment and Vedanta pledging 1 lakh crore rupees. Rachna joins us now from Jaipur. Rachna, industry making big investment commitments there for Rajasthan. Take us through the details. Absolutely, Shireen. I am in Jaipur at the Jaipur Exhibition and Convention Center. And there's a nip in the air here. Of course, it's a winter evening, unlike Mumbai. But the sun is all set to shine on Rajasthan's economy with the view of investments that we've seen just today being announced. Uh, Rising Rajasthan, the three-day investor summit, has kicked off this morning. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, along with Chief Minister of Rajasthan, Bhajan Lal Sharma, inaugurated the session. And this summit uh, is uh, seeing participation from 32 countries and is set to facilitate uh, Memorandums of understanding worth 35 lakh crore rupees. In fact, Chief Minister Badanlal Sharma outlined a clear vision for the state. He said that the first goal for this, inve uh, this investor summit is to attract uh, such investments that would end up uh, having double income for the state of Rajasthan, along with aligning state's growth goals with the national growth goals. And third is to create millions of jobs through these strategic investments. He also highlighted uh, that the sectors that they're focusing on are infrastructure and power and so said that the, for the first time in India a nine greenfield greenfield express highways would be uh, getting constructed here in the state of Mahara, uh, in the state of Rajasthan I'm sorry uh, he also announced that the power generation capacity goal for the state which is right now at 30 gigawatts is all set to go up to 125 gigawatts in the next five years apart from the minister's inaugural session also saw participation and big announcements coming in from corporate bigwigs and their subsequent commitment towards the state of Rajasthan first was Mr. Anil Agarwal of Vedanta who announced 1 lakh crore rupees investment through Hindustan Zinc and creation of about a lakh of jobs with a, with a goal to co contribute about 10,000 crores annually to the state's economy. Apart from that, the Adani Group, led by Mr. Karan Adani, announced plans to invest 7.5 lakh crore rupees across various sectors in Rajasthan, but with a special focus on renewables. Kumar Mangalam Birla and the Aditya Birla Group also committed about 50,000 crore rupees uh, for the next two years with special focus on renewables and gearmarking 
about 10,000 crore rupees just for renewables. Ultratech Cement continues its operations, committing to the state as it has with a capacity of 20 MTPA. Anand Mahindra was also here and he announced that the plan is to take Club Mahindra. Currently, there are six Club Mahindras in the state of Rajasthan. The plan is to double it up in the next five years. This was a wrap from day one of Rising Rajasthan. Satyo Rajasthan, Rising to hai hi, reliable bhi hai. Rajasthan, receptive bhi hai, aur samay ke saath khud ko refine karna bhi janta hai. I'm from Rajasthan, my family is from Rajasthan and we are very proud to belong to this state which is, you know, uh, stands for enterprise and risk taking and uh, you know, social enterprise as well. Right. You did give us a snapshot into your investments and how they would be increasing. Can you take us through? You spoke about fashion retail. Or would have so, a yeah, we have about thirty thousand crores of investments planned over the next five or six years uh, in the areas of cement, renewable energy, and retail. So it'll be about fifty thousand crore in the next two years. Thank you. The Adani Group plans to invest over rupees 7.5 lakh crores across various sectors of the state economy. Beyond energy, Rajasthan is critical to our ambition to become India's largest cement company. We will set up four new cement plants to build additional capacity of 6 million tons per annum in the state. Well, from Rajasthan now to aviation, Air India is stepping up its expansion plans after placing an order for 470 aircraft from Airbus and Boeing. The airline has ordered an additional 100 Airbus aircraft. Madhya is standing by now with the details. Madhya, take us through this latest order coming in from Air India. And, uh, you know, it could have something to do with the kind of delays and pressures that Boeing perhaps is facing as well, couldn't it? Absolutely, Shireen, and it's really a big announcement coming from Air India. 100 aircraft additional to the 470 that were ordered last year clearly shows that Air India is aggressively looking to expand its uh, capacity to capitalize on the fast-growing passenger traffic and also, like you said, to meet the shortage of aircraft owing to uh, challenges at Boeing's manufacturing facilities. So, yes, uh, the new 100 aircraft order includes 10 wide body A350s and 90 narrow body A320 family aircraft. That means Air India will have 50 wide body Airbus A350s. The aircraft type also indicates that Air India is aiming to emerge as a global airline flying across continents, you know, uh, taking flights from India to ultra long haul destinations like the US, the UK. And Chandra Shekharan, the chairman of Tata Sons uh, and Air India, said that they see a clear case for Air India to expand its future fleet beyond the firm order. Uh, of the 470 aircraft that was placed last year. He added that these additional uh, 100 Airbus aircraft will help to position Air India on the path to greater growth. Remember, Air India just concluded the mega merger of four airlines, Vistara with Air India and Air Asia India, uh, which is uh, now AIX Connect with Air India Express. So, such a large airline uh, needing uh, a huge fleet, uh, of course, uh, warranted a uh, more aircraft uh, for the Air India group and that is why we are seeing the 100 new aircraft on order now. All right, Madhya, many thanks for joining us. That is the latest there from Air India. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Business 360. The news will continue right here on CNBC TV 18. Stay tuned. We're back in a moment with more.